you stand as we worship. Lead us, Terry. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Hear our hearts, Lord. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. Let's sing, church. sing, Lord. you may be seated. Come on up here, Pastor Nick. Whether you're gathered in this room or joining us online, I want to introduce to you a new pastor, a new staff member at Lenexa Baptist Church, a young man who will be serving in the evangelism ministry. Would you encourage and welcome Pastor Nick Swearingen? Hey, y'all. How's it going? Hey guys, like Pastor Bill said, my name is Nick Swearingen. I'm the new Associate Pastor of Evangelism. Uh, I just wanted to get up here and introduce myself and a little bit of what I'll be doing. Uh, a little bit about me. I grew up here in Kansas City. Um, I went to college at Kansas State University, which is where I started following Jesus my freshman year of college. Um, yeah, that's what we're celebrating. Um, and then as I went through college, I, I graduated with a degree in microbiology and pre-medicine. Uh, pre but God redirected my path and I ended up not going to medical school so I could go serve in Southeast Asia for five years. 
Um, and over my time throughout doing that, God continued to put young adults here in Kansas City on my heart more and more. And so as I, as I found myself uh, at a crossroads, I, God put it on my heart to move back here and start something called the Block KC with one of my friends. And as uh, my friend Luke and I started the block, our, our vision was to help young adults build their life on what counts. And we saw a lot of our friends just weren't really interested in going to church. They were really interested in learning more about God. Um, but the really cool thing was that as we were dreaming this up, one of our friends said, hey, you've gotta meet with Pastor Chad and Pastor Jim at LBC. And so we sat down with them and I mean, honestly, they just, they poured a lot of gasoline on it. They just said, what can we do to encourage you? And guys, it's been phenomenal. Um, getting to have this church's partnership with that movement has just been a huge blessing. And now getting to be a part of this body, it just fires me up. So first of all, thank you guys for being so welcoming here. Like I have felt so welcome and especially transitioning off the field. It's just been a really, it's been a huge blessing to me. So I just wanna tell you guys what a special thing we have learned Lakes of Baptist, you all know this, but uh, just as a new person, it has felt really good. Um, but I wanna tell you guys more about the Block KC. And so the Block, our vision, like I said, is to help young adults build Build their life on what counts. Uh, we want to, we believe that by following God that young adults can be used to transform Kansas City and the entire world. Um, honestly, that's something that we get excited about. And the cool thing is that we've already seen lives be transformed. Uh, people are starting to follow Jesus and it's been incredible to be a part of. Uh, our audience is two people. They're stereotypical people called Casey Joe and Casey Jane. Casey Joe like the barbecue. Um, but Casey Joe is 24, 25. Uh, he probably has minimal church background, if anything. He's probably in a job that he just thinks that making more money is gonna make him happy. He's probably got a regrets because of past relationships, because of substance abuse, because of some kind of addiction or something like that. And ultimately he just feels very apathetic towards his life. And that's most of the people that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis who don't know Jesus. And Casey Jane is very similar, 24, 25, uh, minimal church background, probably in a relationship with some guy that doesn't really care about her, but she doesn't wanna leave the relationship because she knows that, that's where, that she feels like that's where she's gonna get love or that's where she's gonna get acceptance. Um, probably has a lot of self-image issues. And guys, these are the people that we care about. And we do that because as we've seen um, people come to Christ, I've, I've realized more and more, and I, I saw this in my fraternity back in college, that, that Christ loves the people that are far off from him. And that was me at one point in my life, and so I'm just so grateful um, that I can partner with this church and get to be here and get to be a part of reaching Casey Joe and Casey Jane. My invitation um, to you all is if you're in this age range, we would love to have you to our first block night of the year on January 27th. It's this upcoming Thursday at 7 p.m. in the K Hall. Um, and the, the point of a block night is to invite people that maybe don't have any church background or are not following Jesus or that are very, very new believers. Um, it's welcome for anyone if you're a mature believer or not. Um, but the goal is to have something that's gonna challenge them to consider following Christ and so that they can look around and see, I'm not the only person investigating this. And really at the end of the day, what we want it to be is just a resource for your personal outreach. We want it to be an evangelism tool to where you can invite someone and then follow up yourself with those personal conversations. We're gonna talk about how to invest your 20s and early 30s. So again, the age range is 20s to early 30s, like 32, 33, somewhere in there. We don't check IDs. so. Uh, um, but the invitation to the church at large is, first of all, just again, thank you guys for making this possible. You guys have been so generous and just, I mean, I don't have to go far to see the generosity of this church, but your, your giving is changing lives. Um, like I said, people, people are coming to Christ and lives are being transformed and eternities are being changed. And this is really impactful for me because these are my friends. These are the people that I love dearly and you guys are getting to be a part of seeing entire, like, entire lives change. And guys, that's future families, that's future parenting, that's future marriages that are all being saved as a result of the gospel going forward and Jesus doing the work to transform lives. And so, again, please keep praying, please keep giving, but also just invite someone. If you know someone who's in that age range, just invite them, tell them about it. You can bring them and introduce them to someone. You can check it out. We don't mind. Um, and we'll have more tangible ways to continue to serve in the future. But again, I just, 
I can't tell you guys how much it means uh, to get to be a part of this body and to get to be a part of taking the gospel of Jesus forward. Um, it's something that I know has been very impactful for me, and I can't wait to continue to see how God really revolutionizes young adults here in Kansas City through his good news. So I'm going to pray first real quick, and, and again, come find me afterwards. I would love to meet you. Um, so, yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are just so grateful for the fact that you have died on the cross for our sins and that you were raised to life and that we can have new life with you. Um, God, that is just the the greatest gift that I can ever ask for and that we can ever ask for. And God, I pray that as we are worshiping here today, God, that we would not lose sight of that and that we would focus on how good that is. God, and as we're singing, we'd be singing because we're people who have been transformed and redeemed greatly. Uh, God, that we would go out and be people who forgive greatly and people who love greatly because we have been forgiven and loved and very greatly um, loved. Uh, and God, just thank you. Um, I pray that all of the, the teaching today would continue to be a blessing and that we'd be doers of the word and that we'd be worshipers in spirit and truth. And so we pray all these things for your precious son's name, Jesus. Amen. before 
ね。my sins and my sorrows. church for his amazing love. Congregation, you may be seated. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. I want to encourage you to open them to Revelation 11. Revelation 11, we're going to look this morning at verses 15 through 19. I held off in completing 11 because there's one verse here we need to camp on for a little bit this morning. Revelation 11, beginning in verse 15. I want to welcome all those who are joining us online and also Reach Church DeSoto. We're grateful to have you with us this morning via our live feed and then also the venue service right down the hall. Grateful that all of you have joined us today. In Revelation 8, uh, 11, uh, chronologically, we have moved right up to the end of the tribulation period. 
The world has seen the incredible judgment of God. We've seen famine and wars, earthquakes. The judgments of God have been so severe that people cry out for the rocks to fall on them and to hide them from the presence of the wrath of Christ. One third of the earth has been burned up. The vegetation destroyed. Uh, sea life destroyed. Fresh water has become bitter and poisonous. Locusts and demons have been unleashed upon the earth. One half of all mankind is now dead. And yet in the midst of it all, God has been gracious and God has been patient. God has provided 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Can you imagine 144,000 Pauls preaching the good news of Jesus Christ? Calling men and women to Christ and to trust in him. God has also provided two witnesses who reenact the ministry of Christ. They stand as representatives of the law and the prophets, preaching to the people. They're rejected and they're killed. They're resurrected and they ascend. It's the final miracle of God, the final invitation of God to a world and to this nation. And Yet in spite of all, as we've seen in Revelation 9, 21, they still did not repent And God has been patient to the very end. He desires that none should perish, but all come to faith and repentance in Christ. But now, as we come to the end of this tribulation period, his patience is spent. And the time for the finality of his wrath to be poured out on the earth has come. And we pick up in verse 15. So read there with me. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, and sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer. As we pray this morning, I want to encourage you to be in prayer for uh, Phyllis Hughes, our dear brother in Christ, Herb, went to be with the Lord this weekend. Many of you know Herb. He now sees his Savior face to face. His faith has become sight. And so we rejoice with him as we know he's in glory, but we pray specifically for his wife, Phyllis. And uh, we'll try to get word out to the church about the arrangements as we learn of them this week. But as we pray, as we begin our study, let's pray for, for Phyllis and their family as well. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you this morning. We thank you that you're the God of all creation, Lord of heaven and earth. And yet you love us and you sent your son Jesus to die for us. To make a way of salvation for all of us who would believe and turn from our sin and turn to Christ in repentance and faith. We thank you that through Christ we now have access to you. We can come into your presence and cry out, Father, and know that you love us and you hear our prayers. We pray very specifically this morning for Phyllis Hughes, and we pray for the rest of Herb's family, God, that in these days in which they make decisions, they would see your good hand. And God, they'd be reminded that even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with them. We thank you for Herb, who was faithful to the very end, loved you, and we know today his faith has become sight. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, Lord, we we rejoice with him today. We celebrate a life well lived and pray, Lord, that you would encourage us to come around this family and love them during these days. God, we ask now that you would bless the study of your word, speak to us. Open our eyes, open our heart, let us hear your voice, draw us to yourself, and we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, as we begin there in verse 15, it says, the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. 
This is the final trumpet of God's judgment. And we'll see later in chapter 16, the bowls of judgment will be poured out. But right here in verse 15, this is the apex moment of God's salvation history. That the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. This is the moment that we have been waiting for since Genesis 3. And what I wanted to do here, because I don't want us to miss this. I want to take a moment to give you an overview of God's salvation history from Genesis to Revelation. All right, so we'll be here for a couple hours. I hope you brought a lunch. But it's worth stopping and being reminded of this glorious plan of God that is being worked out today. And at this point in Revelation, the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. You remember in Genesis, we'll, we saw a perfect creation. As the psalmist tells us, the heavens are declaring the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the works of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth. The utterance is to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. It rises as a strong man to run its course. It's rising from one of the heavens. Its circuit is the other end of them. And there's nothing hidden from its heat. God's creation as he made it is perfect. He made everything that we see by the power of his word. And he looked upon it and said, that's good. That's really good. And the centerpiece of his creation was man and the woman. They were God's vice regents. As the Puritans used to say, God's vicars. They were ruling in the stead of God. But in chapter 3, you'll remember we saw the fall of man. Satan enters the sea, enters into the scene, and he lies to the man and the woman. Did God really say, you shall not surely die? And Satan did what he always does. He lies, and he deceives Adam and Eve that God cannot be trusted, that God is not really good, that God is holding out on you, that God simply knows that if you eat of that tree, you'll become like him, and you won't need him anymore. So the lie of Satan is just get rid of God and you'll be free. Break free from his chains and then you'll find true joy and fulfillment. Is that still not the voice of Satan in our world today? And they disobeyed. They ate and there was death. And the kingdom of God was lost. Paradise lost. And the kingdom of Satan begins and man now has a new master. Satan is the God of this world, the ruler of this world. The whole world lies in the grip of the evil one. And man is now enslaved to sin and Satan. He's held, held captive by Satan to do his will. And everything is broken. Man is no longer naturally inclined to follow God and his truth. Man has lost a sense of morality and truth now becomes subjective. And the family is lost it's lost its cohesiveness. Gender is gone. You can make it anything you want it to be. Pronouns are gone. Marriage is a mess. The world goes from order to chaos as there's now no final standard of truth by which to judge. And it's called the kingdom of Satan. And yet right after the fall, you'll remember God makes a promise that I'm going to send someone, one man, and he will crush Satan's head, but he'll be wounded on the heel. It's Genesis 3.15, what we call the first gospel, that one man is going to come. He'll be the seed of the woman. He'll have no earthly father. He will be divine. He will be God, and he will make things right. He will defeat Satan, and he will set the prisoners free. Or as Jesus put it, he'll come into the strong man's house, and he'll bind him, and he sets the prisoners free. And he, this one man, will bring all things back under God's rule. But he would have to die. And God set apart one nation, Israel. And he entrusts that nation with the promise and with his word. That Messiah, the Christ, who would come and make things right, would come through this nation. And he gives this nation a knowledge of himself. He gives them the law of God, the word of God. 
And as this nation clings to the promise of God of the coming Messiah, and as they live in obedience to God's word, they would demonstrate to the world a picture of God's kingdom, that they would anticipate the coming of Messiah and his eventual rule and reign. But Satan does what he always does. He attacked this nation, lied to them, just as he did with the man and the woman in the garden. And they were led into sin and idolatry. And they were taken captive by Assyria and Babylon and Greece and Rome. And this nation that was intended to be the light of God and a city on a hill. Demonstrating and anticipating the light of Christ that would come. They fell into darkness. But when all hope seems to be lost. When it appears that the light of God and his promise has been completely extinguished. There's a little flicker in Jerusalem. There's a priest by the name of Zacharias who is clinging to God along with his wife Elizabeth, the promise of the coming Messiah, and he goes in the Holy of Holies, and an angel announces him that he is coming. And then the angel appears to a young teenage girl in Nazareth and announces to her that she is going to have a son and he'll be called the son of the most high and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom would have no end. And he came just as God said through Seth and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jesse and David and Joseph. And Jesus comes. And he preaches like no one else. He preaches as one having authority. And he performs miracles like no one else. He performed miracles over demons and disease. He walked on water. He healed the lame. He calms the winds and the waves with his very word. And he even brought a girl and a grown man back from the dead. He is the word of God. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And as it says in John, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came to his own, and yet those who were his own did not receive him. And the Jewish leadership conspired with Pilate to have him killed. And they beat him, and they mocked him, and they spat upon him, and they scourged him. And a sign was placed over him as he died on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the king. Of the Jews. And just as Isaiah had promised and prophesied a hundred years prior, like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who is considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? And on a hill called Golgotha, the hill of the skull, he died for the sins of the world. And it appeared again like all hope was lost and the light had been extinguished as darkness once again fell upon Jerusalem. And yet, as Joseph said, what they intended for evil, God intended for good. And in the unfathomable wisdom of God, out of the most horrendous act of violence and evil and murder, the cross, our sin was paid for as Jesus died in our place and rose from the grave victorious. And now through his perfect life and sacrificial death, the righteousness of God was provided as a free gift of grace through faith. That now, through no act of your own, apart from believing in Jesus, you could be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That you could become a a child of God, a co-heir with Christ, through faith in Christ. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, so that no one should boast. And Christ left behind 11 men. And even though Christ was gone... He wasn't really gone because they were there. And filled with the Holy Spirit, they went out with the message of salvation and the kingdom of God that had come. And they announced to the world to bend the knee to the lordship and reign of Christ today. Why? Because he's coming back. This king who was, this king who has come, one day he will come. And what were 11 became 100. And Peter went out and preached And 3,000 
And then they became 5,000. And the message of hope and of the Messiah, the king, began to spread, even in the midst of persecution. And it went out to Samaria and Ethiopia and Ephesus and Thessalonica and Corinth and Rome. And for over 2,000 years, this group of people called the church has announced that Christ the King has come and that he's coming back. That as Paul said in Acts 17, that God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world through a man. For over 20 centuries, the church has offered the world a perfect king who is God and is the only means of salvation, that there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. That he's the way to God because he's in keeping with the truth of God, and therefore he alone is the bestower of life, or as Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And we have pled with men and women to trust in Christ as your Savior and as your King. Our message is bend the knee to the Lordship of Christ, or as the psalmist put it, do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. That we cry out to a world that you can Bow now willingly and know his grace and his forgiveness and his freedom and his peace and the certainty of heaven with him forever. Or one day you will bow forcibly as he returns as the hawk bringing judgment. But one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this group, the church, just as Israel was called to do, now we are called to live in such a way that we anticipate his coming. That we, as we live and act, we anticipate the full realization of his reign as we bend the knee to his lordship today. And all the while we have existed in a world that is held captive by Satan. But one day, one day there will be the removal of these people. At the beginning of the tribulation period, something we call the rapture. And this group who has bent the knee to Christ and his lordship, as Paul said, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the, the Lord in the air so we will always be with the Lord. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, not everybody's going to die. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Just as Noah and his family were removed prior to the, the flood of God's judgment, just as Lot was removed from Sodom prior to the fire of God's judgment falling, like Rahab was removed prior to God bringing judgment on the city of Jericho, so here the church is removed as the judgment of God begins to fall on a world that has rejected him. And then we, in this world, experiences a tribulation period, a seven-year period of time known as the time of Jacob's trouble. A time when God will again renew his purposes with Israel and bring judgment on a fallen world. But even in the midst of judgment, God's grace is extended as 144,000 Jewish evangelists proclaim the gospel and an innumerable amount of Gentiles will come to faith in Christ even in the tribulation. But there will still be a world of people who will not repent and after seven years of judgment and wrath poured out on a fallen world, the patience of God is spent, and the seventh trumpet sounds, and the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And the world that was lost at the fall of man 
is now brought back under the perfect reign of God and his Messiah. You see why we had to stop there? Because if you just read that verse without the context of all of God's word, you would miss the fullness of the statement. This is where history is headed. Do you realize this? This is the beauty of being a believer in Christ and having God's word. 40% of the Bible is prophecy. It's God telling you what's going to happen before it occurs. God is proud of the fact that he knows the end, not at the beginning, but before the beginning. And he is sovereignly in control. It's the beauty of God's word as I went back over this. Do you realize the word of God spans 1,500 years, 15 centuries between Moses and the gospel of John? 40 human authors, six civilizations, Three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and a smattering of Aramaic. And yet from beginning to end, they are all saying the same thing. God's love, man's fallen rebellion, and God's redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. It's the beauty of God's word. Well, now look with me at verse 16. A lot on 15. We're going to move quickly through 16 through 19, and verse 16, and the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God, who are and who were. And you'll notice there, in the earlier in Revelation, they rejoiced in who was and is and who what? And is to come. But now, he's no longer is to come. He has come. They rejoice in the God and give thanks to the God who, O Lord God, who are and who were. Because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. These 24 elders, we've talked about this in Revelation, they represent the church. It's us, the church. Uh, we anticipate Christ coming. And here, as this announcement has been made, we fall on our faces and we worship. And you'll see here, they praise God for his power, that he's almighty isn't this beautiful? Nothing and no one can stop God from fulfilling his perfect will and plan. That the scripture says, we know whom we have believed and are confident and persuaded that he is able to keep that which we've committed unto him against that day. That what God has said and declared will come to pass. We praise God because he's almighty. We praise God because he's eternal. Have you ever spent time thinking about where God came from? Can I just encourage you, don't do it. Um, after you've gone back a billion years, you're no closer to the origin of God than when you began. He is eternal. It means forever. No beginning and no end. Don't you love this? The fact of the matter is God never arrived. He's always been. And we believe in a God who transcends time and space and yet has penetrated time and space in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. We praise God because he reigns, and one day he will put down all evil, he'll make things right, and this world will once again be brought back underneath the perfect power of his control. You know, th this is what the study of Revelation is intended to do. As we study Revelation, it's intended to bring us to our knees and worship a God who's, who's sovereign. He's almighty and he's eternal and he's in control. It brings us confidence as we rejoice in the God who's sovereign over all the circumstances of life. As I was reading this, I was reminded of, I heard Kevin Ezell, he's the president of the North American Mission Board. I heard him speak at this chapel service at Midwestern last year and and uh, he said uh, he, he's a big Kentucky basketball fan, loves Kentucky basketball. I don't understand that. I don't, I don't know how anybody could love Kentucky basketball, but he loves Kentucky basketball. And uh, he said, I never watch a game live. Never watch it live. He says, I record it and then wait and see if we won. And if we won, then I watch it. If we lost, I don't even watch it. He said, it's removed so much stress from my life. <laughs> he said, you know how enjoyable it is to watch a game when you know you've already won? You don't get mad when the ref misses a call. You don't get mad when there's a turnover or a missed layup. 
because you know you win. That's us. Church family, this is the beauty of studying Revelation. We know how this story ends. So we don't get too overwhelmed or stressed out when things don't appear to be going our way. When the brakes are down, when it appears that we're losing the battle, we read Revelation to be reminded that God wins the war. And so while this world is losing their heads, we don't lose ours. We know the peace of God that transcends all understanding because we know the end of the story. We worship. Look at verse 18. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints of those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. So this announcement that Christ will reign, and it just it enrages the world. It's really, in many ways, an anticipation of the battle of Armageddon. That battle in the valley of Megiddo right there and outside of Israel, outside of Jerusalem, where the nations of the world, the nations of the world will gather together against Christ. And uh, it's not a very long battle. (laughs) Christ wins. We're going to study it. But they rage. But it's also a time of reward. A time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints who fear your name. You know, ultimately and most importantly, our reward is Jesus. Our reward, the goal towards which we strive and we long for it is Christ. But Know this, scripture indicates over and over again that in some way, believers in Jesus Christ will be rewarded. The scripture tells us over and over again that each one of us will be judged. Now, those of us who know Jesus Christ will not be judged on the basis of our sin because our sin has been covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, but our life will be judged on the basis of whether or not we live for our glory or the glory of Christ. Scriptures replete with these references. 2 Corinthians 5.10, I could give you five others, but 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one, even here in Revelation, it says small to the great, doesn't matter who you are, each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so while a nation, the nations and the world rages, It's a reminder that this will also be a time of reward. We'll talk about this later, but after the church is raptured, we will experience our own judgment. And I don't know about you, but it's a good reminder to me that I want to make sure that my life and my passion is investing in the things of eternity more than the things of this earth. We'll be recompensed, rewarded, And then in verse 19, the temple of God which is in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Here we see the heavenly temple. The earthly temple is just a shadow of the heavenly temple. But here the uh, the, the heavenly temple is opened and the glory of God is uh, revealed. The the ark appears... The ark in the Old Testament, I spent a lot of time here, and I'm going to just be honest with you. I don't know I fully grasp this, but I do know that when the glory of God is revealed in the Old Testament, it's always a very frightening thing. And the ark always represents the presence of God. So in some way here, the heavens are open and the world that has rejected Christ gets a glimpse of his glory as the temple is opened and the ark is revealed. You know, in the Old Testament, you don't look upon God and live. You remember Uzzah in 2 Samuel 6? He sees that ark fall and just reaches over. What happens to him? Struck over and he's dead. You remember uh, in... um, Second Sam, or First Samuel 6, the Philistines capture the ark and they send it back and it goes to Beth Shemesh. And some of those people decide, we're just going to look in and see what's in there. What happens to them? 50,000 of them die like that. You remember King 
Uzziah, he gets a little arrogant and confident and says, I can go in the holy place. I can do whatever I wanted to. I'm a great king. And the, the priests say, don't go, don't do it, don't do it. And he goes in there to offer incense. And what happens to him? Struck with leprosy. Do you know the message of the Old Testament? You don't enter into God's presence flippantly. He is far more holy than we can possibly understand. And so here at the end of this tribulation, the temple is open. The ark of God and his presence is revealed. And what is it accompanied by? What it's always accompanied by in scripture, thunder and earthquakes and a hailstorm. Judgment is now falling upon the world. Let me just make some practical applications for us this morning. Number one, if you're here today or listening online and you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to understand something very, very clearly. One day you are going to stand before a holy God. And I don't know what picture of God you have in your mind. A lot of people, old man, Long white hair and long beard sitting on a stool. Let me tell you, that ain't, that ain't the picture of God you need to have. He's far more holy than you can possibly understand. A lot of people say, you know, I, I fear hell. Listen to me. What you really need to fear is standing before a holy God without the shed blood of Jesus Christ covering your sins. You are going to stand before the holiness and the glory of God who is all-powerful, sovereign, and eternal. And your only hope is Jesus Christ. The one who is promised in the Old Testament, the one who has come, lived, and died, and rose. And he's the only means of salvation God has made available to us. Trust in Christ. Repent of your sins and turn to Jesus in faith and repentance. Bend the knee to Christ. And I can tell you this today. He's a perfect king. And he will not only promise you life eternal, but you'll know true life today through faith in him. Now, for those of us that do know Christ, as we continue to study the book of Revelation... There's a lot of principal truths that we are learning. But the one that sticks out to me as I continue to read this is that all the stuff of this earth, it's nothing. And I don't know about you, but I have been very convicted that far too much of my life is focused on the earthly and the temporal rather than the eternal. This ought to change our focus That what is it that drives your life? What is the passion of your life? Are you storing up eternal treasure in heaven? Or are you trying to store up some earthly treasure that is wood, hay, and straw, and one day it'll be burnt up? And what is eternal? I'll tell you what is eternal first. The souls of men and women. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When was the last time you discipled somebody and showed them what it means to study God's word and how they can hear God's voice on their own? It's called making disciples, and it's the one mission that God has given to us. My mentor used to tell me all the time, he said, Chad, no, in the grand scheme of things, it won't matter how many people showed up to hear you preach. What will matter is how many people love Jesus more as a result of having known you. How many people love Jesus more because they know you? How many people will be in heaven on that day because you invested in their life? That's what matters. Do we have a hymn? Not necessarily a hymn. In uh, 1926, there was a man born by the name of Stuart Hamblin. Anybody know the name Stuart Hamblin? uh, Hey, man, there's some folks that know Stuart Hamblin. Stuart Hamblin came to know Christ in a pretty dramatic fashion. He was a 
musician, an actor, radio show host. But he came to know Christ, it changed his life. He was out one day on a hunt and a hike with his good friend, John Wayne. And they happened on a little hut, a little cabin in the woods. And they went inside to find a man who had passed away all by himself. Had his Bible there, and his dog was sitting by his side. And it inspired him to write a song called This Old House. Some of you will know this. If you don't, go home. Don't, don't just listen. I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to try I might get a little jingle as I get going because it's too good. But go home today, and there's some good gospel groups that sing it. But it says, this old house once knew his children. This old house once knew a wife. This old house was a home and comfort as we fought the storms of life. This old house once rang with laughter. This old house heard many shouts. Now she trembles in the darkness as the lightning walks about. This old house is a getting shaky. This old house is a getting old. This old house lets in the rain. This old house lets in the cold. On my knees I'm getting chilly, but I feel no fear of pain because I see an angel peeking through a broken window pane. And this is my favorite verse. It's the last one. My old hound dog lies there sleeping. He don't know I'm going to leave, else he'd wake up by the fireplace and he'd sit there howl and grieve. But my hunting days are over. I ain't going to hunt no coon no more. Because Gabriel Dunn brought in the chariot when the wind blew down the door. Ain't going to need this house no longer. Ain't going to need this house no more. Ain't got time to fix shingles. Ain't got time to fix the door. Ain't got time to oil the hinges nor mend that window pane. Ain't going to need this house no longer. I'm getting ready to meet the saints. Is that you today? Paul says this earthly body is nothing but a tent. One day it's coming down along with everything else associated with this world. Are you today getting ready to meet the saints? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word that is perfect and good and true. And God, it's always my prayer that our time in your word on these weekends would only whet our appetite to hear more of your voice and your word every day of our life. That as David said in the psalm, one thing I've asked the Lord and I shall continually seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all my days. To behold his beauty and meditate in his temple. God, I pray that if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, I pray today they've heard your voice in your word. I pray that they would know that you knew them before the foundation of the world. You knew everything about them, every sin they would ever commit. And yet you loved them so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for their sins. And maybe right now you're speaking into their heart and you're drawing them to yourself. God, I pray that they would step out in faith and trust you. I pray that they would know that your word says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved and God I pray for those of us that do know you I pray that we would walk in daily fellowship with you that you would be our king and we would live in subjection to you and your word and we would be the light of the world a city on a hill and that through us, this world would get a little picture of how beautiful our king is and how wonderful is his reign. And we would anticipate that day when the kingdom of this world shall become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. God, I pray that we would fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. I pray that we would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing all these other things will be added unto us. I pray that we would set our hearts and our minds and our, even our hands and our feet 
to this one mission that you've given to us, which is to make disciples. Lord, help us until that one day when you call us home. May we live faithfully to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we give you an opportunity to respond in whatever way God is leading on your heart. Maybe you would like to know Christ. You'd like somebody to talk to you more about what it means to follow Jesus, trust in him as your Lord and Savior. We'll have pastors here at the front. Maybe you'd like to unite with our church family, become a member. Maybe you've been through our membership class and you want to make it official this morning. This would be the time when you would come forward. Maybe you just want prayer. This is your time, though. Remember this. You'll never regret obeying Jesus. So you respond as we sing. Shall ever be, and how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me, and how marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever. can see we've had some respond at the altar. I love reminding our online viewers that the altar call is open to you as well. If the Lord has laid something on your heart or is he dealing with you, your Holy Spirit drawing you to salvation, we'd love to hear from you either through email, via Facebook. You can call us, but the altar is equally as open to anyone joining us online. We're going to sing through that refrain one more time. And don't miss this opportunity to respond. Let's sing together. congregation you may be seated just briefly this morning i want to introduce you to some folks first of all jamie why don't you come on up this is jamie bell she comes this morning she's attended our membership class had an opportunity to share her testimony she's already gotten plugged in with our orchestra already participating and serving but she comes this morning to make it official and say i'm coming to become a member of lenexa baptist church so jamie we rejoice with you so grateful thank you thank you thank you And next, I want to introduce you to Ron Uzalak and Jeannie Reynolds. Y'all both come on up here. Jeannie is a member of our church family, but this is Ron Uzalak, and he's coming today. Been through our membership class, shared his testimony. Ron and Jeannie are getting married pretty soon, so we rejoice over them. So many of you know Jeannie. Now I want to encourage you to get to know Ron. You're going to see them together a lot in the coming days, uh, but they're a great couple just love them so much and Ron we're grateful that you would desire to make this your church home your church family and just as we said with Jamie I pray that we'll be the church that God has called us to be it's good to be in God's house amen amen Uh, I want to encourage you if you're a first-time guest uh, stop by our welcome center we had we do have a gift we'd like to give you if you came prepared to give your tithes or your offerings the offering boxes are out in the foyer area you can give online Uh, Thank you for being so faithful. Encourage uh, Pastor Nick Swearingen as you have opportunity. Having come off the field, Southeast Asia, serving, plugging in here, uh, joining up with Pastor Steve Barnes. If you know Pastor Steve Barnes, boy, he is passionate about telling people about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, Nick Swearingen, he's passionate. Between the two of them, we might set the world on fire. Who knows what's going to happen? But we're grateful to have him. And I want to encourage you. There is, uh, this way I'm thinking about this, what... What Pastor Nick is doing is, is just joining up with what God is doing with a lot of young men and women today. You know, this God is on the move on college campuses today. There are men and women, young men and women, being saved, trusting in Jesus Christ, enjoying a relationship with Christ and making disciples. This is not a ministry. This is a movement of God. God is still sovereign. 
Christ is still king and he is still saving men and women today. And uh, so be encouraged. There's a lot of bad news to look at today. You want some good news? Come talk to some of this pastoral team. Go talk to Pastor Nick. He'll tell you. And you know what you can do? You can get started discipling. What I found, if you're spending so much time discipling others, you don't have time to listen to all that bad news. And so join up with us. Let me pray for us. We'll be dismissed. God, we thank you for this morning, the opportunity to be in your house. God, I thank you for Jamie. I thank you for Ron and Jeannie. I thank you for them coming this morning to unite with our church family. And I pray that you'd bless them as they come and help us to be the church you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation you've provided for us through your death, burial, and resurrection. And God, I pray that we would go and tell the world about King Jesus, what he's done for us and what he can do for them. Make us faithful, Lord. Give us boldness. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.